So thanks, Terry, for introducing me and welcome to the series on deep learning in the Python lecture. Uh, actually, before we start, who has heard of deep learning before? Maybe raise your arm or machine learning. Uh, who has worked with machine learning before? Okay. Who has implemented BERT from scratch, a model? Okay, so anyone will learn here something. And the next three sessions are focused on deep learning. Um, we have the first session today, which gives you the fundamentals. So here you will learn uh, everything about machine learning that you need to know to move to deep learning. Of course, since we have a limited number of lectures, there's much more that you can explore, but those are the basics. And from those basics, we'll move to deep neural networks. We'll implement them in a, in a framework called PyTorch. It's probably the most used Python framework for deep learning today. And in the last lecture, we moved to the actual application. So what can you do with deep learning? And one of our core research areas from Terry and me is natural language processing. So we'll implement a specific model from scratch that can understand text and do reasoning about text. So uh, since we only have three sessions, I won't be able to cover everything that is to be covered about machine learning and deep learning, but they're great books. So uh, one book that I have actually read is Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. This is probably the fundamental book about machine learning. If you're coming from a math background, it's a great book because you will get in-depth uh, yeah, in depth calculations about machine learning and you will get all the proofs behind machine learning. Uh, if you're not from math, it might be a bit difficult, but nevertheless, uh, here you will find basically everything you need to get started with machine learning applications. And then, Probably my most favorite book and also something that I used for these lectures is Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow and some other authors. And this book will take you from the, from the starting point of machine learning, give you the basics, move all the way up to nat natural language processing, image processing, and so on. This is a great book. And there's two other books that I put here, which are more applied uh, in Python. So here you will not only learn the theory, but the actual coding. Uh, and there's a more recent one, Dive into Deep Learning. I haven't read this one, but I heard good things about it, so I put it here. Uh, okay, so let's start. What is deep learning? Um, you might have heard of artificial intelligence before. If not, artificial intelligence is the desire to make computers do smart things or intelligent things. So we want to mimic human behavior in computers. And this is something that has been out since the first idea of computers. So when the first computer was designed, we already thought about how can we make this computer intelligent. We, just, we, do, we didn't just want it to have being a calculator. We wanted to do intelligent things like reasoning or uh, telling us what, what an image is depicting. And this started back in 1945, uh, and we'll see later a bit more details, that uh, chess computers were developed. So there's Stockfish, for example, a popular chess computer. And this is kind of an intelligent behavior because it can tell you at each position in a, in a chess game what is the best position to move or what is the best piece to move at which position. So these systems work by taking rules about the chessboard, for example. So you have a position and if the queen is not, uh, is not covered, you should take it. So that's a rule in the system. But that's not very intelligent because you have to define each position and each rule yourself. So something that came up in the 1980s is, how can we come up with these rules automatically? So given some sort of game from a grandmaster, how can we learn uh, the best positions and the best moves? And during this time of machine learning, models got more and more complex. So uh, we tried to incorporate more features and more techniques into these models until we noticed that the more abstraction a model has, the better it works for certain problems. And this is where the most recent trend in 2010 came, which is deep learning. And deep learning is basically a variation of machine learning with abstraction and more representation. So you can also read online what these things mean. Uh, for example, IBM defines artificial intelligence uh, as a field that combines computer science and data sets for problem solving. So, we have some sort of experience we learn from, that's the data set. Um, and we have computer science methods that, that work on top of this data set. And then they solve a specific problem with that data set. And deep learning uh, is then a computational model with multiple 
processing layers. That's where the deep comes from. And these layers give a certain level of, of abstraction to learn the problem. So uh, let, let's compare how, what we have seen before in the lecture in classical programming. So classical pro programming takes some information like, uh, for example, the position of the chess pieces on a board and some rules. So we define these rules. When do we move which piece? For example, if the queen is not covered, we take it. If there's a bishop on e2, we take it always, some of these rules. And then the answer of the program is what to do. So I give you a chess position, and now you tell me what to do. I run it through the program. There's a lot of if, else, for loops maybe, and then I get the best move. So machine learning is a bit different. Now we have the information as well, the position of the chess pieces, but we give some samples of what we think is the best move. And we want the model to learn this complicated function of if and for loops to tell us what, what are the rules. So for example, this could be, we have a hundred of grandmaster games. We know these people are really good at playing chess. They're the grandmasters. And we give these games with the winning and losing positions and which move was taken for these positions. And the machine learning model will learn the intrinsic behavior of the grandmaster at which point you have to do what. And the great part is that there's some sort of generalization. So if there's a new game that was not played before, the machine learning model will be able to estimate what is a good move in that position. Another reason for machine learning versus classical programming is that you might think you can define what a chair is. Okay, so a chair has a backrest, has a seat, and four legs, maybe. Um, so that's a chair. And if I define all of these uh, things in the image, I can tell you that this is a chair given any image. So there's different chairs. Some of them have four legs, others don't. Um, they have different shapes, they have different colors. And also we don't know how the, the picture was taken. So they might be taken from the top. We don't see any of the legs or any of the backrests and so on. So this gets really, really complex. So, and we're trying to get, or to, to, be, to come to a model that can take into account all of these different variations. And that's very difficult to do with if else statements. You can only go up to a certain degree. And one of the motivations on how we can create such a model is the human brain. So uh, we think we're smart and that's why we want it to be the model the same way. And we, we looked at things that the human brain does compared to programming. So for example, on the top, you can see the way how humans would translate a sentence. This is an attention map uh, of, of human behavior. So you have a word and you have the corresponding word in English and France, and you measure how much the human looks at one phrase compared to the translated phrase. And there's certain connections between the two sentences at specific positions the human would translate in a way. And this is exactly what we would also do in a deep learning model. We would want the deep learning model to try to connect these words to each other's and then translate them in a way. Uh, on the bottom left, this is from a psychologist study where people looked at how humans identify other humans. So if you look at a face from someone else, the first things you look at is the eyes. That's the first thing. And then you look at the nose and the mouth, and then you scan kind of the boundaries of the face uh, to see if, if you know that human, if you haven't seen him before or her before. Uh, so that's also something in vision models for deep learning, we want to mimic that behavior. And on the right, uh, it's something similar for human pose estimation. So how does someone stand? What is their body language? Are they dancing like in this image? Or what are they doing? And here we look at the joints, uh, at the different positions of the muscles and so on, or the bones in this case. So to learn this behavior, we need some sort of abstraction. We need to, to find these uh, specific features in the image. And that is done by multiple layers, as it's called. So you might have some input image here. It's a digit of four. And then there's, there are coming multiple layers of abstraction to find these key points. So for example, if we go back for the four, this could be the edges of the four um, or specific points of the four. And if these points are correlated in a specific way, then these layers of abstraction learn it's a four. If there's a nine, there's other features that lead to, to be the nine. Um, and that is very similar to how humans would classify such an image. Okay, so uh, let's take an example so we can better understand what that means. 
Uh, this is probably the oldest data set used for machine learning in, in any application. It's called the IRIS data set, and it represents a problem that a lot of biologists have on a regular basis, and that is to classify different typologies of flowers. So here it's the iris flower. There's three different types. Uh, so to us, they almost look the same, but there's, uh, there's specific features that are different. So the sepal is one part of the blossom and the petal, and they have specific widths and lengths. And if you measure these things, you can actually classify which one is which. Or even from the image, you can classify which one is which. So if we look at rule-based systems, so that's classical programming, everything we've done before in the lecture, we would come up with a script and we would maybe ask experts or we, we would come up with some observation to think, okay, whenever the sepal length is larger than 5.3 centimeters, then it's a, a virginica. If the sepal width is larger than 3.1, it's a setosa and so on. So we would come with, with all these rules. We would forward the measurements and then we would get the answer. And that's, as you can see, already a bit limited because there might be some variations uh, in, in these measurements. If we move to machine learning, we would look at some sort of a data distribution. So given that we know maybe a hundred of these flowers, we've observed the measurements of these flowers, we can plot the data distributions. And here you can already see a bit better what, what the trends are. It's not just one measurement that is important, but the combination of multiple measurements. So if you look at the sepal, uh, what is this? The sepal width and the petal length, you can very much separate the red, which is the setosa, from the green and blue, which is the versicolor and virginica. And using this data model, now we can find boundaries between the data to actually classify it right most of the times. Okay, and the last part, and now we're moving to the actual topic of our three sessions is deep learning. Now we're interested in some sort of abstraction. We're always talking about abstraction, but what does it mean? So if we have an image of a flower here, uh, it would in one stage look at the edges and it would just extract the leaves of the blossom. So that's the first picture here. I don't know, you cannot see the mouse, okay. So here, that's the first picture. It would extract the leaves of the blossom. It would put a focus on that. And in the second pictures, it would just get the edges of the leaves. In the third one, it would just get the stem here of the blossom. So there's different abstractions of the same image that lead to different answers. And for our problem, this might be the width, the length, and so on. And these features, they're all learned throughout the learning process of the model. So we can automatically adjust them when the data, data changes. Okay. Just a quick word of warning before we start. Um, since we only have three sessions, we won't be able to cover everything that is in data science and machine learning, but we'll give you the fundamentals to move to deep learning. Uh, I, I can just highly encourage you to get into these books and get more background knowledge on the topic because you don't wanna move directly to deep learning, then you will have a problem later when you encounter different problems. So we'll give you the fundamentals, but there's much more to explore uh, just so you are aware. And this actually is a great resource, the AI expert map. If you want to become an expert in AI in, in the uh, future, check out this map. They have a lot of different resources uh, that you can learn from. Okay, so deep learning started basically in 1945 or 1940s. And there's three, three big eras of machine learning and artificial intelligence. The first one we call cybernetics. That's like the first computational models we came up with for learning simple problems in biology. And then we have connectism or connectionism, uh, which is actually then a more intelligent system that is based on multiple instances of learning neurons, we call them, similar to the neurons in the brain. So we are connecting different learning units to each other to create networks uh, of neurons. And now we have, since, since the 2000s or 2010s, we have deep learning and now we have large computational resources. You might've heard that some of the largest models take as much energy uh, as driving a car for a year. So these models are really huge and they can solve complex problems like autonomous driving. So the first thing started in 1943 and it was actually, it was actually an idea inspired by a single neuron in the brain. So 
If you think about how neurons in the brain work, they have some sort of inputs from other neurons, and then they fire at specific points. So maybe you get afraid of something, so some specific neurons that have to do with being afraid fire at that time, and they release some neurotransmitters in your brain. Uh, and something similar is what we wanted in a computational model. So here, X is an input to the neuron. So that's something, some information we process, could be an image, could be text, could be speech. And then W is some sort of uh, learnable parameter that we can adjust. And we have this function that the neuron will fire at specific points. So for example, if there is a dog in the image, it should fire. If there's a cat in the image, it shouldn't fire. That's a, a little bit more complex problems, but that's basically how it works here as well for more simple problems. Um, and things you could solve with this, it's not so fancy as self-driving, but logical reasoning. So and and or are things that can easily be represented by these neurons, and you can replace logical gates with it. Um, a more complex version was then proposed in 1958, and now we're more getting to how the brain actually works. So now we have not only the single neuron that should fire, but we have other neurons that fire inside the neuron we have, and our neuron fires into other neurons that we have. So it's actually a representational model of the brain. And the function gets a bit more complex, but it's still the same. So we have a sum of all the neurons that come into our neuron, and then we have a function sigma that fires to the other neurons. And this sigma can change. It's not a simple threshold, but it can be continuous among the space uh, of neurons. So it might be a different value if 10 neurons fire in versus five. So it's a bit more you know, nonlinear and representable. Uh, and also in this paper uh, from 1958, in, in the Perceptron paper, they had the first algorithm to actually learn uh, these connections. So that was also breakthrough because before that you had to manually engineer them and that was close to classical programming. So now you could learn them automatically. So this sounds great, uh, and we can do many things with this still today, but uh, 1969 book found that this is actually not as useful as we thought, and there is a problem in the next lecture we will explore where this doesn't work. You might have heard of the X or problem. It's a very simple logical problem, but uh, the perceptron cannot really solve it, and that's a huge problem because then more complex problems are difficult to solve. Okay. Um, the backpropagation algorithm 1985 is a breakthrough because now we can learn all of the different neural networks and architectures using a simple algorithm. And this is 1985. We, can, we still use it in all of the deep learning frameworks today. So this has not changed throughout time, which is crazy. It's like uh, almost 40 years and the same algorithm is still used. So if you have an idea how to change that later, uh, this would be a breakthrough. Uh, but it is an algorithm that has still application today. Um, and we'll go into this later, but it basically is, is still used in all of the frameworks, yes. Okay. Uh, some of the architectures that came up in the recent years, 1997, is, for example, the long short-term memory, which solved the problem of neurons having limited capacity. So if you want to understand books, which are really long sequences of text, you would need to, to apply this algorithm all the way back throughout time in the book. So if you have hundreds of pages, uh, you can imagine this is a very costly process to go back in time through all this text. Uh, so what long, short, uh, what long short term memory uh, tried to do is to introduce specific gates in the process so that you can remember text from before without actually having to go all the way back or also to forget specific text that is not that relevant. So this is an iteration on top of neural networks that introduces uh, yeah, specific gates that can learn long-term problems. And it's, it's still used today in natural language processing, but there's newer versions of it that we'll talk later about. Another breakthrough for vision problems, and this is everything that you can see in Tesla's full self-driving, uh, that you can see in all of the image applications probably that you find online is convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks are the to-go solution introduced in 1998 to solve almost any vision problem today. There's very few papers that use something else and there's trends coming up, but almost anything that has to do with visual perception is solved with this model. So 
um, what, new, uh, what convolutional networks do is they try, to, they try to perceive or they try to maintain a perceptive field of the image. That means if I give you an image of a car in the upper left corner and a person in the lower, left, lower right corner, the network will be able in later stages to preserve that location of the car and the person. If we go back to, that, uh, to, to this definition of a neuron, this won't be possible. Because in this case, what you would have to do is you take the whole image, you take each pixel as a neuron, and then you forward it in the network, and it will be really complicated to say which pixel was from which location in the image. While in the convolutional case, you keep this dimension of the image, and you forward each layer is now not a neuron, but is another image. So each image is another representation of the original image, and you can keep that uh, semantic, or we, we call it perceptive field, of the locations in the image. And that's very useful if you think of autonomous driving, for example. I want to know at which position the person is, right? I don't want to hit the person on that position. So it is very important to know that it's at this position in the feature map. And then on top of CNNs, uh, one of the largest image nets was trained, which is, uh, image net is, an, is a uh, data set of 10 million annotated images, a thousand different object instances. So there might be dogs, there might be cars, there might be bicycles. And then one of the real breakthrough was AlexNet, which showed that you can learn these problems in a very parallel way. And whoever has worked with graphical processing units knows that they have thousands of different cores to, to do operations at the same time. And this way, they were able to learn such a large problem at a very parallel uh, scale. And this implementation, or some sort of this implementation, is now used in all deep learning frameworks again. So to speed up the learning process, now we're trying to put all the calculations in parallel on a graphical processing unit instead of sequentially doing them on a CPU. OK. Um, yeah, maybe just a few words here. This is the most cited deep learning paper today, uh, ResNet. It's only from 2015, so it's quite recent. And the idea is super simple, but the application is large. Again, almost all the networks you will find today have this implemented. What they found is the more levels of abstraction we add to a network, so let's say we have 50 layers, 100 layers, 200 layers, the more difficult it gets to learn the problem. And why is that? There's two reasons. So one is if we learn a representation to the next layer, it is really difficult to learn an identity of the previous layer. So an identity is just the same thing. You would think that's very easy to learn, but it is not. It is actually very complicated because of this activation and the matrix multiplication we've seen before. So what they did is, let's add the identity back. So they just take one step from before and add the identity to the next layer, and that helps a lot with learning networks. Another thing that we'll talk later about is called the vanishing gradient problem, and that just means the more layers you have, the more you have to go back when learning the the problem, and the more you go back, the smaller uh, the, the learnable problem becomes. So in the beginning, in the first representations, there's only minor changes in the learnable parameters compared to the end, so it becomes increasingly difficult to learn the first representations against the last. So this discrepancy uh, is also solved by this here, but we'll get into this later. Um, maybe I'll skip this here. This is actually really cool. It was developed in Göttingen. Uh, by Professor Ecker and his team. It's called the style transfer or neural style transfer. And what they do is they take a lot of images and they separate the style of the image by the content. So you can take any image and apply a different style. So for example, here's the Mona Lisa and different styles of Monet on the right uh, or others. And this is actually pretty cool and useful because you can generate art in a specific, spe specific style that you like without actually having the artist. Uh, also in 2016, one of the uh, DeepMind AIs, AlphaGo, was introduced to play the game of Go. So chess at this time was solved. You could beat any grandmaster in chess with machine learning. But Go is a bit more complex. It's a larger board. There's more variation in the game. But in 2016, and this was a breakthrough, they beat the, uh, the world master Lisa Dahl uh, on TV. And this was the first time they ever played a grandmaster in Go. Or beat Grandmaster and go. Okay, so 2017, 2018, now we're in a time where it actually gets more interesting for us in natural language processing. 
some of the most used models today were introduced, the transformer and BERT. And the transformer and BERT solve a problem in natural language processing that again has to do with, with how, you, how you learn large problems and how you parallelize a problem. So if you have long texts, you have to go back in time, as I said before. So if you have a long, I don't know, book, for example, you would have to go all the way back in time to learn the parameters. And with transformers, you can do that in parallel. You don't have to go back in time anymore because the transformer sees a text not as a sequence only, but also as a way to, you know, parallelize all text in the beginning and then just give some positional information about the text instead to go all the way back to time. And BERT is built on top of transformers, which we'll see in lecture 11, and we'll actually implement this model then from scratch. Okay, some, uh, some other cool things that came out last year is Dolly and Stable Diffusion, you might have seen it. So now you can generate art with text. So this text here I put is an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style, and that's the image that, that you get. Uh, you can generate a lot of different digital art, uh, you know, oil painting art, photorealistic art with this model. And how it basically works is they go out on the internet, on Google Images or whatever, and they take a lot of different images and their captions. So there might be this image in Google, and it says an astronaut riding horse. And then they align this with all the other images, and they say this image and this caption match, but this image and another caption don't match. And what you get in a kind of semantic space, if you imagine it, you have all the different images and only the images that have the right caption are matched in the space. So if I provide a new text, the model will be able to generate an image that is very close to images that had also this caption. Uh, and there's some denoising process. We'll talk about this again more in lecture 11. And then ChatGPT and GPT-3, uh, those are things that came out this year and 2020 are probably today one of the largest language models available. And you can interact with these models as you would with a human. So ChatGPT is, in, is a conversational AI. You, you might have heard of it or tested it already, but if not, I can highly recommend it. Go to chat.openai.com. Uh, some students use it to do their assignments successfully. So it's, it's actually really powerful. Um, but yeah, you can ask it a lot of different things about science if you need help uh, writing, I don't know, uh, your paragraph, of course, if the content is yours, that's the, pre, uh, that's the prereq. But yeah, conversational AI changed with this model, which was released this year. And something I use every day is open, uh, GitHub Copilot from OpenAI Codex. This is a model to write code for you. So if I want to write a function, I know which parameters I want to give, uh, what are the things it should return, and I can tell my IDE, which is VS Code, please fill this function. And then Codex or Copilot will fill the function for me. I'll check if everything's right, and then I'll just use it. So that's really helpful, and it saves a lot of time. I think in the future, this will change programming a bit. I mean, you still need those experts that are really good at programming uh, and who can also check how these functions work. But most of the code, especially unit testing, I just do like this. So. I can also recommend you to do it if you know programming. If you don't know programming, you cannot check whether the function is right, of course. But uh, this is something great because it, it saves you so much time in programming. Okay, full self-driving has been out for some time in beta from Tesla. Uh, I think they will release the full version in two weeks. And they, uh, yeah, they have, does the video play? Okay. Yes, I can't really see the last one. Yeah, it's just the video. So here you can see that even in the city, the vehicle is able to steer among complicated situations. It can uh, see passengers, parking cars, avoid obstacles, and so on. And how this works is they have a specific deep learning model for each problem. So for example, one model has only one learning function to see where the boundaries of the street are. So the model does nothing else but looking at the images and it looks if there's a boundary of the street uh, or not. Another model is only concerned with where are other drivers at which positions. Uh, one model is only concerned with seeing stop signs. Another model is only concerned with seeing uh, traffic lights. And all these models are then composed together to do a decision, uh, usually in Germany or in Europe, uh, the law says that you have to have a majority voting for certain th systems like uh, planes, for example, or cars. 
So there's a majority vote if three systems, uh, two of three systems agree, the decision is made. If not, it's not made. Um, and they only use camera. This is also interesting. A lot of the other companies, they use radar and lidar. Uh, Tesla only uses camera because they say humans also only work on vision. They only have eyes. They don't have any other sensors and they work just fine in driving. Um, so if you don't know what, so radar is good for estimating the speed of another vehicle when it's raining or when the weather condition is bad. And LIDAR is good for estimating the distance to other vehicles. Um, but Tesla says you can just do it with cameras. We'll see if that works. Okay, enough about the history. Now we start with some basics on machine learning. How does, how does these systems work under the hood? And for machine learning, you basically need three things. And that's also true for deep learning. Um, so first of all, we said that machine learning algorithms learn from data or experience. And we basically want to perform a specific task. So we want to, for example, identify all of the objects, all of the uh, vehicles in a scene of a car. So that's the task. That's what we want to do. Uh, and then we have some experience. And experience can be different, but it always has some sort of data we learn from. So uh, yeah, we want to learn a problem by observing the street, for example. So we want to see where are the cars, and our experience is observing the street. And we also want to know how good we are at it. So there's some performance measure P that tells us if we're good or not. So if we hit other cars, we're probably not as good as detecting the cars. Or if we have, I don't know, speeding tickets, we might also not be good at detecting some things in the street. And our assumption is that the more experience we collect, the better we get. Of course, this is only true up to a certain degree. Uh, every one of us can probably drive, and we're not getting much better even if we drive 20 years. At some point, there's some, okay, now you're good, uh, but you won't get any better. And that's also true here. But at the beginning, the more experience you get, the better you get. Okay, so what can be tasks? We've seen some examples, but let's be more concrete. One of the most used tasks is classification. So we have some data, and we want to know if it's one of these K categories. So we have some real space. Uh, this could be an image. So that's the pixel, uh, the, the light of the pixel, for example, or it could be a text. Um, and we want to map it to these K categories. Uh, here's an example. Will the Bitcoin price decrease, increase, or stay the same for tomorrow? Um, and the input could be the open price, the closed price, uh, the high and low of the day. So how, how did the price uh, develop over a year? And then the output is three categories. It will go up, it will go down, or it will stay the same. So the function we want to learn is 365 numbers, that's the year, times four values, and that's the open, close, high, and low prices. So there's already one, one simple problem we have here. The probability that Bitcoin will stay exactly the same is very low. So the category we will observe most is up and down. We can define staying the same as a small error margin around the current price. So let's say if the price goes up 0.3% or down 0.3%, we'll say it's actually the same and everything else will be up or down. Okay, and then we can learn a model with this task. We can also ask the question if we, or how much will the price change? So if it goes up or down, how much will it go up or down? So now the function we try to learn is, again, from the real space uh, in n dimensions, and it maps to some real number. And this real number tells us how much it will go up or down, positive sign up, negative sign down. So it's, it's the same problem, but mapped to a real value. And, Classification and regression are the most used task you will see uh, today. So uh, in deep learning, those are you can almost formulate any task in these two or, or similar to these two. There's also denoising. Um, this is used more recently. You have some image and you want to reconstruct the original image or you have some text, you want to reconstruct the original text. So here we mask some of the faces and then we want the model to generate the faces back. And you might have seen that you can also generate uh, yourself with Tom Cruise's face. This is something that works basically like this. So uh, you, you try to reconstruct a, a different face from the face you see here. So you have some examples X and X tilt or yeah, X tilt. And you try to estimate the conditional probability of P of X given X tilt. 
So you try to reconstruct the probability of the uh, actual image from some uh, corrupted image. And another application or task is machine translation. You have again X and X star, which are sequences of some symbols or tokens. This can be words, this can be characters, and you want to translate one to the, to the other language. So you're trying to estimate the probability of X star given X uh, again. So this is similar to denoising, but you don't corrupt the sequence. You have two sequences and you try to reconstruct the one from the other. So, um, okay, here's no animation, that's fine. Uh, dog versus cat is a classification task. So you're trying to, to estimate if it's a dog or a cat. The output is one or two for two categories. And the real space is the number of pixels in width and height. So if it's a grayscale uh, picture, you usually have eight bits. So that means you have 255 uh, values of light. And you can do that for three dimensions, red, green, blue. And this will give you the real space for the input and then two categories for the output. And that's the function you want to learn. So maybe a more, bit comp more complicated mass language modeling. We'll talk about this later. We have a sequence of words on the bottom here. So the sequence of words is how are mask doing today? And we want to know what this word might be. And if we learn what this word might be, uh, we can understand how language works at a, at a larger scale later. So what is this task? Uh, anyone has any idea what this task is from the ones we've seen before? Just raise your arm if you know it. Okay, uh, this is a denoising task because we're corrupting the sequence with this mask token and then we're reconstructing the, the sequence using uh, one word. And it's also classification because we have a limited number of tokens here uh, that we want to classify from. So it's a combination of these two. Okay, so now that we have a task, we want to know how good are we at the task. And there's different measures how we can do that. So one intuitive one or a simple one is accuracy. We want to know how many examples did we classify correctly and how many examples are there in total. And that sounds reasonable. So if we classify seven correctly and there's 10 examples, we have 70% of accuracy. So like this example here, we have three cats and one dog and we classify everything as cats and we have 75% accuracy. So that's pretty good, but we didn't classify any dog correctly. So that's not good. Uh, and we, we want to have a measure that can tell us if we classified uh, something that we retrieved good. So for one, you can balance the data set to have two dogs and two cats to see if the model always assigns one category, then the accuracy would drop to 50%. So that's one thing, but maybe only have these four pictures because those are your favorite pictures of cats and dogs and you cannot balance the data set. So we need another method to account for this problem. And one of the ways you can do that is precision and recall. So precision and recall split the problem of accuracy into two parts. So precision tells you how many of the retrieved items are relevant. That means, okay, so stay with me. Uh, how many of the items did I actually classify correctly? That's the ones we've seen before. How many of the items did I classify correctly? And then how many did I classify also as positive, also as cat, but they were not correct, okay? So here, if we go back, the true positives would be all of these cats and the false positives would be this cat, okay? And then the recall tells you how many of the relevant items are retrieved actually. So how many of the cats did we get? And we got all, we got three. So that's three over three. We have the, the true positives again, three, but also there's no false negatives because there's no cat we didn't get, okay? So all the cats we got right. So we can have another example here with, does the image show a dog? And those are images of dogs and muffins, and they look similar. So we always say, yes, it is a dog. Um, and in this, in this sense, we get all of the retrieved items, right? Here, the recall has to be high because we got all the dogs. We got all three dogs. We also get, did get the muffins, but we got three dogs. So the recall is 100%. We got all the dogs, that's great but now the precision should not be high, right? Because we got the dogs, but we also got a lot of false positives. We got a lot of muffins that are not dogs. So we said they are dogs, but they're not. So the, the precision now is 50%. And this way we can you know, balance between both scores to see 
what are actually good assessments. Uh, can you think of a way that how we can make the precision 100%, what the model has to do uh, for the precision to be high and the recall to be lower? So what, what do we need to do to make precision high? Oops. Maybe you can think a second about it. So precision, we want to have, for, for precision, we want to have the dogs being correct, but we don't want any muffins to be dogs. Then we have high precision. So if, if we classify a dog correctly, but not the muffin, then we get high precision. It doesn't matter if we get all the dogs. It just matters that we just get the dogs correct. Anyone an idea what the model could do? Yeah. Okay, that, that, yeah, that's a good starting point. You, you label everything as not a dog, okay? But then, the, then you don't have any dog, right? Then you don't have any true positive. So the precision would be zero, but it's a good starting point. You label everything as not a dog, and only the one that you're super certain about, this one you label as a dog. So if your model gives you probabilities for all of these pictures, and it says, ah, not sure, not sure, not sure, not sure, not sure, but this one I'm pretty sure, you only label this one as a dog, okay? Then precision is one, because you have a true positive, it is a dog, yes, but you don't have any false positive. You didn't label any of these as dogs. And then you have 100% precision. So if you let your model only classify the ones it's really certain about as the right class, you'll get 100% precision. So if you see papers or studies that just report precision, I would be a bit careful. And if they only report recall, also it is a bit, you know, you have to have both. You have to have the balance of both. And there is a score that calculates both. Okay, and for experience, experience is manifold. It's, you can do various things uh, from experience, but in deep learning, there's three main categories uh, for experience. There's supervised learning, everything we've seen for now. You have data and you know the answers. Image, doc, uh, text, language. Image, I don't know, location. You already know what you want. But there's also problems where you don't know. So there's unsupervised problems where you don't have the answers. Uh, for example, you might observe a population that is smoking a lot and you see that people are dying earlier, but you don't know if smoking kills. You don't know that before. People didn't know. So you have to have to find some trends in the data that give you answers about whether or not smoking is dangerous. And there's also reinforcement learning. And that's all the examples we've seen with uh, playing games, for example, or interacting with environments. Uh, so you play a game of chess. You move a piece, you don't know if it's a good move, but at the end of the game, you will know whether all your moves were good because you lost or you won. Uh, so you don't have a direct answer, but you have some sort of feedback on your moves that will tell you what are good moves or not. So reinforcement learning uh, is a method to learn long-term from rewards. You get a reward, a positive one, if you moved well in a game, or a negative one if you didn't move well in the game. Okay. So coming back to this example of trends, let's say we have some data distribution that we don't know exactly how it looks like. So we don't have the exact answers. We just have some relationship. So we will call the, the data set X throughout this entire lecture. And X will have two instances of XI and YI. So XI here is the X axis, YI is the Y axis. And this is the relation of the data. So xi and yi can both be multidimensional in, in, the, uh, in the real space. For now, it's just two scalar values because of the ease of the example. And what we want to do is we want to find the relationship between the data. So x could be the amount of workouts you do per week, like how often you go for a run, and y could be how long you live. So there's some relationship. The more sports you do, the longer you live, but we don't know what relationship that is. So here on the figure, we can see the observations we measure from different humans. Someone works out five times a week, maybe, uh, and then lives a bit longer, or someone works out one time a week and lives shorter. So those are the observations we have from the data. And the line is what we want to estimate. That's the actual relation. And there are some fluctuations, of course, because no data is perfect. And some people, even though they don't work out, they might live longer. Okay. 
so what we want to do basically is we want to first have a function that defines the line. I've, I think you all have seen that before in school. So it's just a linear function. Wt times x is the function where uh, x is the, uh, is the variable and then w is some parameter that we want to learn. And we can define how well this line fits by an error function or loss function. We'll call loss function L throughout the lecture. And this loss function describes how well the line fits to the points, how close is it. If it's really off, the distance between each point and the line will grow. So then it's not a good uh, line. And to even increase this behavior to not find lines that are way off, we square the difference between the targets, y, and the function that we want to learn. So if we square it, the, the further the line is apart, the worse it gets, and the closer it is, the better it gets, because then smaller values uh, squared, they get smaller. So we define this loss function here uh, in matrix notation, xw minus y squared, uh, and then we can learn it. So what we want to do, okay, one step before, what we want to do is we want to reduce this loss function, right? We want to uh, find a line that is as close as possible to all the points at the same time. That's our goal. And how we can do that is to move, so let's say the loss function is some sort of uh, square shaped function, right? And we're at, at some point. We want to move into negative direction so that we reach the minimum of the loss function. And the minimum of the loss function will give us this line that is close to all the points. Okay, so what we can do is we can compute the derivative and the derivative gives us the direction of steepest value for the learnable parameter w in the loss function. So then we know in which direction we have to move the loss function to get to the minimum. And for this problem, you can actually do it analytically. So if we take the, uh, the squared xw minus y, we can write it as a, a multiplication of two parts. So just put the square out. Uh, so it's xw minus y transpose times xw minus y. Uh, take the binomial function, and then you can come to an analytical solution. Uh, when you do that, you take the gradient and you get 2xt xw minus 2xt y. Uh, and since L is quadratic and convex in W, we can actually find the closed solution for W. If you put that uh, to W, it will be the pseudo inverse, which is xt x to the power of minus 1, uh, xt y. So the pseudo inverse times x t y. That's an analytical solution of the problem. And if you compute that, you will get the weight that finds the line which is closest to all points. Okay, good. And we can even uh, move more to complex problems. Right now, we just have a line that is somewhere in the space. We can add an intercept to this line. So maybe the line origin is not at zero, but it moves somewhere else. So we have w t or w transpose x plus w zero and w zero is that intercept uh, that can move. So now we can reformulate the model also as being some sort of linear model plus an error term and that we call epsilon and the error term is very similar to what we just seen in the loss function. It describes how well the model is fitting to the points, how much error there is. Um, so what we want to do again, we want to minimize the error. And even though we had an analytical solution before, there is a more general way to solve this problem. So now our function changed to this w transpose x plus w zero. And maybe it is very intuitive actually how we can solve this problem. Again, we take epsilon as being the residuals. That's the offsets between the points and uh, the, the line and we take the square function of these offsets. So it's, it's still the same as here, right? So this here is just the matrix notation of this here. Um, and those squares now, we can again compute the gradient or we can take uh, the sample means to compute uh, the weights. So one thing you might, or one thing that is intuitive is that if you take the sample mean of all the different x's and y's, uh, and square that, then you also get the difference of the line of the points that fits best for all points. Because the sample mean is basically the mean between all of the different points. And so this way you can also write it as w hat, which is the estimated learnable parameter. 
is all the xy's minus the sample mean x uh, x hat or whatever or x x strich, <laughs> and then the same for y. So y i minus y uh, hat, and for the for the intercept, it's just the sample mean of y minus the estimated weight times x. The estimated weight times x is the line we just computed, and the intercept is just the y minus the line we just computed. So it's just the offset. We have the line already estimated. We just need to know where it is. So we take the estimated line and uh, we subtract the sample mean y from that, or sample mean y minus the line. Okay, so now we have seen it for linear relationships, but, um, or wait, one step further. I once said before, yeah. Okay, so one thing we want to do is we want to learn the problem for unseen data. That's a central challenge to machine learning. So we might have observed a data set of 100 males, um, but does it also work if we apply this same approach to 100 samples of females or other genders? And it might not. So this is a central challenge in machine learning that our approach has to generalize to new data. So something that is very important when you use data set is to have some representative distribution across your population. You want to have something that represents different genders, different races maybe, um, different countries, different incomes, and so on, to have a good model that can fit on new, new unseen data. So one part is the data and one part is the model. And on the data side, you have to balance things. On the model side, you have to choose the model that explains the problem uh, without being too specific or underspecific. So for example, here, an underspecific model would be this linear line that we had, right? Because this is not a linear problem. If you apply the algorithm that we just have seen, you might find some line, but it won't tell you much because this problem is at least a polynomial of three, okay? So you have to look how is the problem and how can I solve it up to a certain degree that is enough, but not too much. And one thing we can measure this gap between learning a problem and then evaluating it on new data is to split our data. So we don't have just one data set, we split it into three data sets. The one part, which we call the training set, is, is there to learn the problem at first. So this is how we apply the algorithm on the problem in the training set. And then using the validation set, we choose specific parameters of the model, like the degree of the polynomial. So here we would choose it maybe as polynomial three. On the, on the previous problem, we choose it as a linear problem of one. And then there should be one set, which is the test set, which is completely held out from all this process of optimization. We just use it at the end to show, hey, this model actually works on the problem. So this might be, you take hundreds of pictures from cats and dogs, um, and then you train the model using these images, you validate them using these images, but then you go another day, another time, another weather to take other pictures of cats and dogs, and you use that only for testing purposes to show that the model actually works in different settings. Okay, and then the question is, how do we choose these things? How do we know how much training is enough? How much validation is enough? How much uh, do I need for testing? And there are methods that you can use to overcome these issues. So you can use your entire data set and split it into k equally sized folds or k equally sized chunks. Uh, and this way you can train on all the different chunks at, once, at one time and evaluate on one other chunk uh, at, at the same time. And then in the next iteration, you move that chunk. So you, now you have uh, the second chunk is for testing and all the other chunks are for training. And you don't use the same model for all these different runs, but you train a new model for all these different runs. So at each point in time, you have trained a model on all data, data points, evaluated on all data points, but you never uh, had one specific split that excludes data points from being evaluated. So why is that important? Let's say we just take a data set and we split it into 50% training, 30% evaluation, 20% testing. In the 50%, we only have these male samples, only male participants were in there. In the 30%, there were only uh, women, and in the 20%, there were other genders. So this, this way it becomes really hard if we train on the 50% to evaluate on the others, because there's not, not much correlation. In this approach, it doesn't matter how the data is distributed, 
because, because at each time you take a fold from some part of the data, and this can include male, female, and other genders, uh, and, but in the next step, you take a different fold. So you will always see all the folds at all the, at all the times. Okay, so we've talked about generalization and, for example, the degree of polynomials. Um, some problems require higher degrees of polynomials, other uh, require lower degrees. Uh, on the bottom, you can see some of the problems that appear when you have different degrees of polynomials. In the middle, it is the right degree, the degree that the data is distributed with. On the left, the degree is lower, and we call that underfitting. So even though we can fit this line, and it can explain some sort of the data, it is not the ideal capacity. And the capacity means that the, the power of the model to explain a problem. If the capacity is too low, meaning here the polynomial degree is too low, it cannot understand the problem, and we call it underfitting. The same can happen in the other direction. If the polynomial degree is too high, it will try to fit the exact points of the data. But obviously this is also not a good approach because it doesn't represent the overall trend of the data. So in overfitting, we usually have too high capacity and too much training, uh, and this will lead the model to learn not the underlying behavior, but the exact points that are presented in the training. There's two more important Theorems, uh, Occam's razor is the first one, which tells you to always use the simplest model for a problem that explains the problem. So if you can explain your problem in some linear relationship, you should do that. Um, if, you, if you don't need any more complicated solution, then you should use the model that can at least represent the problem to this degree. Um, and why is that? Because otherwise you would use very large, very complicated models for a simple problem that doesn't require it. And this leads again to overfitting because as we've seen here, if the polynomial degree gets to 100, it might look like on the right where each point is fitted, but the problem is not understood. So you should use the, the least capacity that the model can have to explain the problem. And you might think that some models are just better than others universally, but the no free lunch theorem tells us that this is actually not true. So each machine learning model is as good or as bad as the others, it can just solve a specific problem better. So you might hear about all these different architectures that are really good at solving some problems, and, but they're not really much better at solving all problems. They're just good at solving the specific problem. So if there's something proposed new, usually these models are really good at solving the specific problem, but they're not universally better than others. Okay. So I think that's the last part of the lecture. There, there's two more, okay. Um, we talk about estimators and bias and variance, which are important measures in deep learning or machine learning. So we've seen estimators before. We just define it formally. So point estimator G maps the data set to the parameters. So the parameters in our case were the slope of the line and the intercept and the, the estimator just takes the data set and gives us the parameters. And that's something we want because we want to know what the parameters are given some data set. And one estimator we've seen is the linear regression estimator. It's the uh, pseudo inverse of x times x transpose times y. And of course, the estimator should return some parameter that is close to the original distribution or the original relationship of the data. Um, okay. And yeah, the data is drawn from a random process, of course, and the uh, W is a random variable. We, we had that before. So bias and variance are two measures that you want to keep low when tra training machine learning models. The bias is just the expectation over the data set minus the parameters. So when W uh, hat, our estimated parameters, are unbiased, that means the bias of the parameters is zero, okay? Um, and yeah, good estimators have low bias. And the variance is basically the same variance you know from probability theory maybe. Uh, it's just the standard error over the parameter. And that is, again, a good estimator has a low variance. And there is a trade-off. So maybe without the formal definition, bias is yeah, the simplifying assumption to approximate a target function. And the variance is the, the amount of of the estimate changing with different training data. So imagine you have a model 
on a specific set of training data, um, it, it performs up to a certain degree, like 80% precision and recall or whatever, and you take a different type of training data, how much does it change now the accuracy of the model? And there is this bias variance uh, trade-off or dilemma that you cannot minimize both to be zero, so there is some trade-off. And as you can see in the figure, this trade-off usually lies somewhere in the middle of the optimal capacity. So when you train a model, the bias will reduce significantly and the variance will increase over time because you get more and more used to the training data that you've seen. So if you change it, uh, the, the variance is probably higher on the training data. So we're trying, and this is a curve you will see in training a lot of neural networks, we're trying to keep this generalization error low. That means first we want to learn from the training data to reduce that error, but we want to not come into the situation that on the validation set we're not performing good anymore. Because as we progress in learning, the model will remember the training data and will forget the underlying relationship. And that comes all the way back to what we've seen here in underfitting, overfitting. The more we train, the more likely we are to overfit because the model will remember where the points are and it will not know the relationship, but just memorize, here's the point. And the same way, if we don't train enough, we'll come to underfitting because the model will not understand the relationship enough because it, doesn't has, it didn't have seen enough data to understand it. Okay, the last part, I think we can skip for today if we wanna to go through the notebooks, um, or maybe just quickly. So maximum likelihood is one of the approaches. It's basically a probabilistic view of what we've just seen, and it tries to maximize the likelihood of the parameters explaining the data. So again, X is the data set with IID samples from some data distribution, and the, the model is a conditional probability model from uh, x given uh, from y given x and the parameters and the maximum likelihood uh, estimator is just maximizing the probability of the model given the data and the answers uh, given the data and the parameters from the answers so here this is uh, can be written as the prob uh, as the product of all probabilities so argmax uh, for all parameters of the product of the P model probabilities for each point. So Xi and Yi is a point in the data set and Ws are estimated parameters. If you apply the logarithm to that, it will become a sum, which makes our life later easier. Uh, so it's the sum of the logarithms of each of the probabilities of all the different data points. And <clears throat> if you do that with a normal distribution, for example, you will actually get the same uh, estimator as we've seen before. So if you if the model that you use is a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution and you do the math here, you will come up with a, a maximum likelihood estimator being the actual uh, least square error that we've seen before. So that's one of the motivations to use mean squared error or least squared error uh, functions.